A number of years ago, a chaplain friend took me on a tour of the Maricopa County Jail on Madison Street in downtown Phoenix. The Grimm facility is not an Arizona tourist attraction, I can assure you. Its inner sanctum, where the most violent and vicious criminals are housed, is scary and creepy. The prison officials there have put a warning label on that section of the building. It's maximum security. Now this morning, I actually want to talk to you about maximum security, but not that kind of maximum security. What I have in mind for us to consider is altogether different. It is positive rather than negative in nature. It is soothing, not scary. It is spiritual more than physical, and it is eternal as well as temporal. It's the security that a person enjoys when he or she knows Jesus Christ as personal Savior and belongs by faith to the forever family of God. One of the Bible's classic descriptions of this security is Psalm 23. The words of this psalm are familiar to most people, both Jews and Gentiles, Christians and non-Christians, churched and unchurched. It is generally regarded as the best known and best loved chapter in the entire Bible. Theologian Charles Ryrie hails it as David's most beautiful song of trust. This morning I want us to spend some time together studying the contents of this peerless passage of scripture, even though we may already assume we know it pretty well. I want us to see again just how and why it is that we Christians can lay claim to maximum security in Christ. So if you haven't already done so, open your Bibles with me to the 23rd Psalm. If you need to use the Pew Bible, turn to page 862. And I want you on this hot Arizona day to prepare for a cool breeze that will come your way as the Holy Spirit gives me utterance and uses this portion of scripture to impact your minds and hearts. According to the note, just before the very first verse of the psalm, it's called the superscription. This Hebrew hymn is a psalm of David. We are not sure when David wrote this or why David wrote this, but it's interesting that a number of commentators take the position that David was an old man when he wrote Psalm 23. So he's a senior citizen like most of us looking back upon the various events and experiences making up his life. And he comes to the fundamental conclusion, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Pastor David Roper is probably right though when he contends that Psalm 23 is especially for people young or old alike who are experiencing a major upheaval in life. People who are shaken and in turmoil. Could that be said of you today? Are you going through a major upheaval in your life because of such things as financial setback, marital discord, family problems, failing health, the death of a loved one. Are you shaken and in turmoil? The explosive world situation and the sad state of our divided nation would be enough to make all of us feel that way. I'm sure that we do. A prominent American banker recently lamented in the Wall Street Journal that among Americans today there is a fear of almost everything. So if you find yourself in that boat, if you're anxious and afraid, you're not alone. And may Psalm 23 be a tonic for your soul today. 
The very first verse sets the tone and announces the theme of the song that will follow. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Believe it or not, that statement is made up of just four little words in the Hebrew language. But those four words pack a wallop. They tell us what maximum security is all about. Setting forth its source, the Lord, who is our shepherd, and its substance, the effect upon us because the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. Let's zero in on the source of maximum security first, first of all, the source of it. David emphasizes in that very first verse that the source of our security as believers is God himself. The Lord is my shepherd. One scholar points out all the literary facets of this lyrical gem are focused upon the Lord, whose tender care, ceaseless vigilance, and perpetual presence impart to life all of its color and satisfaction. In designating the Lord as his shepherd, David is asserting something here, not only about the Lord, but also about himself. He was writing out of his experience and tending his father's sheep, so he knew what he was talking about when he hails the Lord as a shepherd. In the same way that Philip Keller knows what he's talking about in the masterful little volume entitled, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. David had learned the hard way that sheep are stupid. They are careless, they are helpless, they are difficult to manage. They are completely dependent upon their shepherd for their welfare and for their safety. As Philip Keller observes, sheep do not just take care of themselves as some might suppose, they require more than any other class of livestock endless attention and meticulous care. And yet, David is informing us here, I'm a sheep just like that. The Lord is my shepherd because I'm a sheep just like that. And if the Lord is his shepherd, then obviously the Lord is your shepherd and my shepherd too. We're all in the same flock. Listen to Psalm 95, which confirms that. Verses 6 and 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people He watches over, the sheep under His care. And like all sheep, we have a tendency to go astray, to turn to our own way, to forsake the shepherd and guardian of our souls, the Lord who loves us and wants to take care of us. Unlike his sheep, the eastern shepherd is a noble figure. He is selfless in his dedication to the flock. He lives with his sheep 24 hours a day. He devotes his life to their care. All of his time, all of his energy, all of his passion. And that's how David regards the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, just like that. He is my friend, my guide, my protector, my provider. He is the source of my security, and what a maximum security that is. A little girl was asked to recite the 23rd Psalm as part of her Sunday school program. Her take on the first verse was a bit off, but she captured the essence of what David is getting at so powerfully. The Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. And David would add a hearty amen to that, and then he would go on to say, actually, he's all I need. What more could I need or want when the Lord is my shepherd? In possessing him, the possessor of all things, Psalm 24, 1, I too possess all things. Now as we examine the source of 
maximum security in our lives more carefully, I want you to notice, please, that the name of God in this very first verse of Psalm 23 is all capital letters. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, is my shepherd. That across the board, capitalization means that the divine name Jehovah or Yahweh appears here in the original Hebrew. The Bible has a variety of names for God, especially in the Hebrew language, but Jehovah is by far the most important of all. The eminent Jewish theologian Moses Maimonides, a giant of the Middle Ages, explains why. All the names of God which occur in Scripture are derived from his works except one, and that is Jehovah. And this is called the plain name because it teaches plainly and unequivocally of the substance of God. Now, what would be the substance of God revealed by this name? How could God even have substance? God is spirit. He's not made of matter. He doesn't have a body like you and me. So what is the substance of the living God? Let me take you back to Exodus chapter 3 to find out. You don't have to turn there. I'll read the portion that I want us to focus on here in just a moment. This is the passage in which Moses has an unforgettable encounter with God out in the wilderness. God appears to him in what is known as a theophany, that is a glorious, visible appearing of God in the form of a burning bush that's not consumed by the fire. This conversation then takes place. Moses said to God, Exodus 3.11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, oh yeah? What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the Lord of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. And the name Jehovah or Yahweh is based upon God's statement to Moses there in verse 14, I am who I am. This name is derived from a Hebrew verb, the verb yaya, meaning to be. The phrase in the original language could be translated, I was who I was, I am who I am, I will be who I will be. To you and me, that sounds like double talk, but not to a Palestinian listening to those words. For those peculiar words unveil to us what God is fundamentally like, what his substance is. According to Revelation 1.4, he is the God who was and who is and who is to come. He is elevated above the flow of time, the flow of time that traps you and me in moments, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks. You get the idea. So God inhabits the past. He inhabits the present. He inhabits the future. He has always existed and he always will exist. He was neither caused nor created. He is the only self-existent being in the universe. And he is simply because he is. One theologian comments on the importance of the name of the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, in terms of its practical 
effect upon you and me. He writes, Jehovah is the name of God that represents him as the God of the blank check. We shall never be confronted by a claim that he cannot meet. Throughout life's, through all life's years, with all of their needs, his wealth is open to our demands if only they are made within the terms of his will. Eternity itself will furnish us with ever new discoveries of his sufficiency. Most of us, especially senior citizens like most of us, have trouble accepting and adjusting to change. We want things to remain as they are. God is not like that. He has the capacity to meet any challenge, to cope with any situation, to adjust to any change. He may be immutable, but he is not immobile. His attributes may not change, but the manifestation of those attributes does. His love, his power, his faithfulness, his wisdom, his sovereignty remain the same, but how they are applied to your life and mine will definitely change, depending upon circumstances, our behavior, and our needs. As one writer suggests, God's answer to Moses' question about the meaning of his name amounts to this. God will prove himself ever dependable and sufficiently resourceful to meet any need of his people. The remaining of his name then assures us that Jehovah is actively present in any and every situation we may face to accomplish his purposes in our lives and to sustain us by his power and his care. Many of us, and again, senior citizens especially, worry about what the future holds in store not just for ourselves, but particularly for our loved ones, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren. If the world is this bad now, how much worse is it going to be in 30, 40, 50 years? Well, here's an area where God's name, Jehovah, meaning I am who I am or I will be who I will be, can be such an encouragement and help to us. God is actively present both now and then. Both in the present and often the future. In 2023 and 2024 and beyond, he will be what you need him to be. In your advancing age, he will be what you need him to be. In the event of illness or bankruptcy, or loneliness, or a child's rebellion, or the death of a spouse, or the outbreak of global war, he will be what you need him to be. Hallelujah. He will ever be dependable and ever sufficiently resourceful to meet any need of his people at any time. Can you see now why David would say, knowing what he knew about the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Jehovah, the great self-existent one, is the source of maximum security for David, for you, and for me. So much for the source of maximum security. And now let's take a look at the substance of maximum security, the substance of it, what it is and what it means to us. David sums it up at the end of verse 1, where he testifies, I shall not be in want. That is, I'm not going to lack anything. Anything that I truly need. I might lack some of the things that I want, I crave, but what I truly need, he will not deny me. Everything that flows from this verse on is built upon that statement at the end of verse 1. I shall not be in want. But a word of warning is necessary in this connection. Not everyone can say, the Lord is my shepherd. 
That's shocking, I know. Not every human being can make that affirmation, the Lord is my shepherd. And here's why. The shepherd, the Lord cannot be your shepherd until the shepherd is your Lord. The Lord cannot be your shepherd until the shepherd is your Lord. Psalm 22 is the prelude to Psalm 23. Psalm 22, as we heard last week in the message that I brought you at that time, is the Calvary Psalm, where the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus was graphically predicted 1,000 years before it took place. It presents Christ to us as our suffering Savior, and it sets the stage for Psalm 23, where Christ is presented to us as our loving shepherd. But dear people, unless you know Christ as your Savior, the one who died on that cross of Calvary to bear your every sin and to shield you from the wrath of God, you cannot know Jesus as your shepherd. Amen. You must put your faith in him as the font of every blessing, as the way, the truth, and the life, or you're not coming to the Father. You're not even coming into the flock of God. But when you do, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and your soul is transformed gloriously, there are three wonderful blessings that are going to be coming your way according to Psalm 23. Those three blessings are Serenity, number one, safety, number two, and satisfaction, number three. Verses two and three of Psalm 23 have to do with the serenity of the believer in Christ. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What a lovely picture this is of peace and rest. And peace and rest is what we all need. It's what we all want. Peace, peace with God. Peace with other men. Peace on the inside, peace on the outside. And rest, rest from all the slings and arrows flesh is heir to, like sin, suffering, sickness, stress, this is what we receive from God, peace and rest, now in partial measure, someday in full unlimited measure. Listen to Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, as El Salt did, one of our choir members this week. He died in the Lord. And as a result... He's entered into a rest. They shall rest from their labor, the struggle, the suffering. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, then I will be free at last. But maximum security includes more than just serenity. It also gives us safety. Safety. And this we find in verse 4, which is so familiar. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, Lord. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now this verse is usually taken as a reference to death. And by all good interpretation, it should be, because that's the primary meaning that David has in mind here. But Psalm 23, 4 relates to more crises in our lives than just the final one of passing out of this world into the next world awaiting us. You will notice in the margin, if you have that kind of apparatus in your Bible, that the phrase, valley of the shadow of death, can also be translated, darkest valley or valley of deep darkness. The Hebrew word applies to more than just death. 
It takes in all of the dark, dreary, dangerous paths we must tread in this world of woe. All along those paths, glens of gloom, as Moffat's translation calls them, we will be safe. For God will be with us. He will protect us with his rod or club, and he will guide us with his staff or crook. Now, it's precious to me to note that in this fourth verse, the psalmist changes the pronoun that he uses in addressing God. In verses 1 to 3, it's he. Now it's you. In verses 1 to 3, David sees the Lord out ahead. He's guiding the sheep along, making sure that the flock stay together and they're all moving toward that destination that he's appointed for them. So it's he. He's leading us. But now in verse 4, he's walking down that valley of the shadow of death. And God comes alongside as his shepherd to give him focused attention, to give him personal care. And it's a relationship now between the shepherd and this individual sheep, this needy lamb. You, O oh Lord, are with me as I go down this dark valley. You carry me in your bosom as a needy, fearful lamb. Therefore, I will fear no evil. I will fear no harm. I will fear no danger. For if God be for me and with me, who can be against me? Let's go back to 2001. to the awful month of September when the United States of America was subjected to terrorist attacks on the 11th day thereof in New York City, in Washington, D.C. Thousands died. Our president at the time was George W. Bush. Most of us, I think, know that he's a professing believer in the Lord Jesus. And in one of the addresses he brought to his frightened, devastated people here in the United States of America in the days right after those attacks, he quoted Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He imparted with those matchless words comfort and peace and strength to all of us, whether we were Bible-believing Christians as he is or not. He assured us that in the arms of the Lord, we are safe. The final blessing that we can lay claim to as part of God's maximum security plan for us is satisfaction. Satisfaction. Here's where verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 23 come into play. And once again, David changes the way in which he's writing I just indicated that he changed pronouns with respect to God in verses 1 to 4, but now he changes the metaphor, the figure of speech. So he goes from talking about a shepherd and his flock to talking about an oriental host and his guests. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This verse reflects oriental customs of hospitality. The Easterner treats his guests with great respect. He truly makes his home their home. He feeds them not just a meal, but a feast. 
any of you who have ever had an opportunity to go, especially with Dr. Charlie Dyer from our own church on a tour of Israel, know what I'm talking about. Because when you go into one of the restaurants, whether it's owned by a Jewish man or an Arab man, and he knows Dr. Charlie Dyer, and he's bringing his friends with him, my goodness, does the food ever get spread out so you can't possibly taste it all, let alone eat it all? It is overwhelming. Talk about putting on the Ritz. They're in the Middle East. That's exactly what happens. Now, if you come into the home of an Easterner and you're being pursued by your enemies, that man will fight for you. He will defend you. He will pour oil on your head to refresh and revive you after your journey. He will fill his cup to overflowing and your cup as well in a display of generosity and gladness because you come into his home or his place of business. And to think that God delights to treat you and me that way should bring satisfaction to our lives. We can be content and confident when we see how much we mean to God. What a friend we have in Jesus. And believe it or not, Jesus says, what a friend I have in you. David puts the frosting on the cake in verse 6. Surely goodness and love, I still prefer mercy. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Hebrew of that closing verse indicates that goodness and mercy don't just follow us along as though they're tagging behind, trying to keep up. Think of two sheepdogs responsible for keeping the sheep together and out of danger. They don't just tag along. They're pursuing us aggressively. They're nipping at our heels. They're reinforcing the care of the human shepherd by doing what they can in their canine capacity. That's how goodness and mercy are in our lives. They follow us aggressively because that's how God wants them to do their job reflecting his love for us. He longs to be gracious to us. He is determined to bless us. He yearns to lift us up. He wants to shower us with goodness and mercy. A mother was concerned about her kindergarten son named Timmy and the walk to school that he had to go undergo each day. Embarrassed by her, Timmy made clear that he did not want mommy to walk with him to school. And yet she wanted to give him the assurance that she cared and, that, and the assurance for herself that he was going to be safe, even though that she could not physically be there because he didn't want that. Her neighbor learned about the woman's dilemma and offered to follow the young boy to school in the mornings, staying at a distance so he probably wouldn't notice her. I'm up early with my toddler anyway. It will be a good way for us to get some exercise as well, said the neighbor. The relieved mother agreed. The next school day, the neighbor and her little girl set out behind Timothy, Timmy as he walked to school with another neighbor boy he knew. She did this for the whole week. As the boys walked and chatted, kicking stones and twigs, Timmy's little friend noticed the same lady was following them as she seemed to do every day all week. Finally, he asked Timmy, have you seen that lady following us to school all week? Do you know her? Timmy nonchalantly replied, yeah, I know who she is. The friend said, well, who is she? Oh, that's surely goodness. Timmy replied, and that's her daughter, Marcy, the little girl. <laughs> Shirley Goodness? Who the heck is Shirley Goodness? And why is she following us? 
Well, Timmy explained, every night my mom makes me say the 23rd Psalm with my prayers because she worries about me so much. And in that Psalm it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, so I guess I just have to get used to it. <laughs> and so do you and I. Because surely goodness and her little girl Marcy will follow you all the days of your life. When you know the Lord as your shepherd and the shepherd as your Lord. This is part of the maximum security plan and provision that he has for us. The Lord is my shepherd. That's the source of my security. I have everything I need, everything that I would ever want. I shall lack nothing. That's the substance of my security. The poet has responded this way. Tis good to remember the way he hath led us, to view once again both the track and the road, to muse on the fact that unfailing he fed us, our faithful and loving, compassionate God. It is good to remember that he himself brought us through all of life's journey right on to this day, forgave us our sins and our blunders and taught us to cleave unto him and to make him our stay. It is good to remember, to pause and to ponder. It stirs us to worship and tunes us to praise. Such retrospect helps us of him to grow fonder whose goodness and mercy have followed our days. Praise God from whom these blessings flow. Amen, dear people. Amen. Did this morning's message from the word of God bring comfort and encouragement to your troubled hearts? Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Let us thank him for that. Lord, we do rejoice that you have been pleased to speak through me unworthy as I am, inadequate though I may be, as your instrument, your tool to communicate. And out of this blessed, very familiar psalm, we have been able, with your help, to extract, we trust, some fresh new insights, or maybe some truths that we've all tended to forget and as a consequence, we've let our anxieties and adversities overwhelm us. When we could just once again crawl into your arms and allow you to carry us next to your bosom as the loving, faithful shepherd you truly are. And Lord, I pray in particular for any who might be here today who are heavy laden beyond the norm. Something is going on in their lives that's overwhelming them, oppressing them, depressing them. So grant them, I pray, not just comfort and reassurance, but strength, the peace that passes understanding, and the blessed assurance, my God is my Savior and my Shepherd and he loves me. And it's in Jesus' name we pray that, amen.